Could you say senator instead of ma'am? I love these members that get up and say, read the bill. What difference at this point does it make? The whole island will uh, become so overly populated that it will tip over and, uh, and capsize. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. We know that the free market is nonsense. This liberal will be all about socializing, uh, um, will be about basically taking over and the government running all of your companies. The time has come for unfiltered, politically incorrect common sense. Welcome to the wild world of Cowboy Logic. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Nguyen. And it is our great pleasure right now to introduce to you, actually making his uh, first, his virgin debut here. Debut Cowboy Logic Radio. Yes, Mr. Najib Najir. He's the former intelligence officer uh, in Lebanon during the Civil War. Currently resides in California as a real estate investor. And he is certainly a Middle East advisor on terrorism and political affairs for Stand Up America. And who we just spoke to earlier, Major General Paul Vallely, who just happens to be our partner, of course, here in Cowboy Logic Radio with um, StandUpAmericaUS.org. But Najee, it is just a pleasure to have you here on Cowboy Logic Radio. And given what's going on in the world, there's nobody that knows better as far as what's Don't happening you. than you. <laughs> so, How are you, Najee? We're doing very good. How are you? What an honor to have you, sir. We've also got Major General Paul Vallely in here with us. I'm here General. from Montana. Hi, Najee. Hello, General. Hey, through Hello, the, uh, the beauty of technology, one person on the West Coast, one person in Montana, and us two here in Atlanta, Georgia. How amazing is that? Najee, I want to um, start. Hold on. I want to say something that's, uh, that's equally as amazing, and right. that is prior to going to the break that General talked about a, uh, a report that he received yep. that is, has been distributed th- at this point to very few people, mm-hmm. and we now have it. We've printed it. Donna has read it, General. I have not been able to because I had to engineer. <laughs> um, well, the, the gist of it is, is pretty well known at this point. General, um, well, Najee actually uh, uh, called on this uh, information. He'll be the one to talk about mm-hmm. it the best, but uh, Najee and I put it together and released it to certain people this morning. So uh, it's very revealing news of what's happening in Iraq. Well, at first, this General Izat Ibrahim al Dori, who was the king of clubs, I re- you know, if you recall, everybody listening, that for a while there we had the whole deck of cards, you remember? And the big wigs were the, the aces and the king of clubs and all this stuff. Well, this Al- Aldori guy was the king of clubs in that deck of cards, but they thought he was dead, correct, Najee? And obviously that's not the case. No, he was not dead. He was in the transition of uh, going in the underworld, leading the rebellion in Iraq from behind the scene. For a certain period of time, he was reported in Syria and uh, uh, until the uh, 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 time Saddam collapsed, he was leading the insurgency over there from behind the scene from uh, unknown location. Now, Colonel Najir, when you went to um, Aleppo with the general... Uh, did you know that he was in that air? Was he in that area at that time? No, that was way before that. You're talking about ten years ago when the Iraq War oh, was okay. uh, just starting. This is the time he. Uh, we don't have any accuracy on this information. He might have been in Damascus, in Aleppo, but he was in Syria with with a group of other Iraqi defectors. So he is essentially teaming up with this guy Al Baghdadi, who wants the caliphate. Because the two of them are Sunnis, correct? Uh, you don't want to say they're teaming up. Uh, 
they are two different entities. Baghdadi uh-huh. wants to uh, create the Islamic Caliphate, uh, abolish the Sykes-Picot Accords that were created at the beginning of the century by the British and the French. Mm-hmm. Therefore, they don't want to recognize these artificial borders. Uh, the loyalist, you can say, or the nationalistic camp led by the Iraqi tribe, the Iraqi national tribe, along with the previous uh, units of the Iraqi army, the one allied with Saddam Hussein. More than 50% of the insurgency of the rebellion in Iraq is, are led by, by, by this group, which al is a, is a tip of the iceberg, along with other senior officers. So it's very wrong to frame it as an ISIS operation or a takeover. ISIS is trying to jump on board of the train just as a repeat of the Syria scenario. Uh, the events in Syria and Iraq are very similar. Uh, ISIS is trying to jump on the Syrian track, uh, detract it from the Western trajectory, trying to become uh, or, or, or to uh, bring back uh, Syria the way it was. They want to create a caliphate over there. Uh, the nationalistic group in Iraq does not want the caliphate. At the end of the day, the two groups are going to collapse on uh, which form of Iraq they want to create. Right now, yes, they are in the same trenches, but there is a deep division and there is a deep mistrust. But they are allied together uh, about ousting Iran's uh, uh, intervention in, in Iraq, in Syria, and the rest of the region. So right now, I guess politics makes strange bedfellows, for lack of a better way of saying it. So al-Baghdadi and uh, al-Duri right now are essentially, and ISIS, essentially trying to, uh, or, or joining, I guess, even though they don't see eye to eye as far as the caliphate is concerned, but their main goal is to oust Maliki, Correct. Maliki and Iran's influence. Besides right. Maliki, lots of Iranian militia, the Quds Force, the Iranian Republican Guard. Uh, de facto, after the liberation of Iraq uh, from Saddam, as the U.S. puts it together, uh, Iran gained the platform of, of, of Iraq. Iraq de facto became an Iranian territory. Mm-hmm. Even though Maliki was a, a, a U.S. asset that was put by the U.S., but at the end of the day, his allegiance was much more to Iran than to the U.S., just as Shalabi. So. Well, they hate Am- Americans. I mean, there's just no way. I, in my opinion, I just don't see as we're ever going to win over the hearts of the locals in that area. We're the great Satan. We're not Muslims for the most part in this country. And I, I just don't see how we're going to change, or we thought we would even change that culture. So Maliki sort of brought this on himself by shunning any American uh, help in the last year or two since we pulled our troops out. And now this is happening. And now he's like, well, uh, from what I could see, maybe we should have a little bit of help. And now you've got the situation with our president, who's so wishy-washy. Nobody knows whether they can trust him. What do you think is going to happen now? Uh, You have to look at Iran as a non-friend of the U.S. in the Middle East. Uh, the U.S. should not have a short memory. It is Iran that bombed twice the U.S. embassy in Beirut. Yep. It is that same Iran that the Obama administration is extending hand right now. It's that same Iran that bombed the U.S. Marine compound in Beirut, killing 300 peacekeepers over there. It's that same Iran that hijacked the airplanes in the 80s that uh, kidnapped U.S. hostages in Beirut, that blackmailed the U.S. for 30 years, three decades in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's that same Iran that assassinated a few years ago uh, Lebanon's Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. It's that same Iran that assassinated uh, more than uh, 15 members of parliament in Lebanon. I really don't understand the uh, extent of the Obama administration, what they're trying to do by extending hand to Iran. Technically, this is not going to diffuse or weaken Al-Qaeda. It's going to reinforce Al-Qaeda because the people are going to simply fight it. 
in order to understand what's going on, you have to understand the background of the problem. The events in Syria and Iraq, you have to look at them from five perspectives. The five perspective, it's the influence on whoever wants to control the energy of the region. From one end, the U.S., from the second end, you have Russia and China. From the second perspective, you have local alliances. You have Iran, the Assad regime, Hezbollah and Hamas on one axis, uh, versus uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, the uh, Gulf monarchies, and Turkey. From the third perspective, it's Shia versus Sunni. From the fourth perspective, it's nationalism versus religious. Lots of these groups in Syria are nationalistic. They don't want any caliphate. They just want to go back to the old Syria without Assad. The Syrian rebellion started for freedom, and when it received no help from the U.S., the extremists jumped on track and hijacked it towards their objective. The same thing is happening in Iraq today. You have the nationalistic forces allied with the previous army, the previous unit of the Iraqi army, with uh, Saddam Hussein, and this uh, movement is led by his daughter, and Alduri and a group of officers, and the majority of the Iraqi tribe are allied to them. And then you have ISIS trying to establish the caliphate, abolishing this border crossing between Syria and Lebanon, and making an extensive media projection that Syria and Iraq are going to be uh, the start of the Islamic Caliphate in the entire Middle East. Uh, the fifth perspective, it's Arabs against Persians. So it's uh, the areas of a unique cocktail in the mix. And uh, you have to know what you are doing and uh, what you are, uh, how you are mixing your cards. ISIS started in Syria. We have notified the uh, CIA years ago, many intelligence services, uh, about uh, what to do in Syria, whom to arm. They never listen. They never send the support to the right group on the ground in Syria. And they left uh, ISIS unchecked until it started to acquire weapons from Syrian territory. It established its headquarters in Raqqa, eastern Syria. Uh, they used to come to Syria to buy the weapon from the local market and then go and again uh, and acquire more acquisition inside Iraq uh, until it, it, it just started recently and, and the whole uh, Maliki uh, syndrome or uh, whatever America has tried to build after uh, Saddam ousting have fall like a house of cards. In my opinion, Maliki is finished. Uh, there is no need to uh, uh, resuscitate an, uh, an outgoing regime, a dead person. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a matter of time before Baghdad will collapse. And the big question will be next, whom does the free world to be in charge of Iraq? The extremists of Al-Qaeda or the nationalistic camp? The intervention on Iran within Iraq is going to create more negativity. Uh, it's going to create more hate, more bloodshed, and uh, uh, it, this is not the right equation to do in Iraq. In my opinion, the, U the U.S. needs to cut a deal with the nationalistic camp, have them put ISIS uh, on the bay, have them uh, stop Iran expansion within the Middle East, using Iraq as a bridge. They use Iraq to funnel troops from Iran, the IRGC, the Quds Force, several uh, Iranian-funded militia. They are all fighting in Syria and Lebanon. And uh, very recently, uh, an Iranian general said that the shore of Lebanon are Iran's frontier in, 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 in the Middle East. Therefore, this talk was uh, intended for Israel, just to tell any mistake you will do, uh, we will use Lebanon as a base uh, to shell the depth of Israel. And so far, Hezbollah has 50,000 missiles in southern Lebanon that will take order from Tehran. Wow. Is this the Tehran that the Obama administration wants to extend and 
That'll be a tragic mistake in the Middle East. It's funny, though, Najee. I feel that it's by design. I really do, be- because this person we have in the White House is one that really uh, is one that was taught to create chaos and create need. And then you come in like the knight in shining armor. And uh, whether it's in the Middle East or North Africa or here on our Mexican-American border, I I really believe that this is by design and he has every intention of this because for over a year now, he's been coddling Iran. You know, he uh, I believe it was about a year ago when he went over there and then came back and said Iran, you know, is going to have peaceful uh, nukes and all this other stuff. They're not going to you know, use it for wartime or anything like that. And Iran actually came out and, and said he's lying like the next day. He said, our, you know, our president is lying. We have no intention of curtailing anything. If anything, their nuke program has been emboldened. So now as... um. A former uh, colonel in the uh, Lebanese army yourself and obviously a a Lebanese uh, Christian. What are you thinking right now as far as your home country? And and what do you think is going through the minds of the Israelis? Uh, First, let me tell you, Iran is attempting to sell the U.S. a pure illusion. Yeah. Okay. Iran will sell nothing to the Middle East but chaos and instability. And Iran has Israel in its aim to eradicate it from the map and dominate the entire Middle East to create what is called the Wilayat al-Faqih, the uh, Shia uh, Persian Empire. The Arab will fight that. They will never accept it on their own. And uh, Iran is the biggest instability in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon. Uh, Look at Lebanon, for instance, today. We have a presidency stalemate. There is no president in Lebanon. Why? Because Hezbollah has created a political vacuum in the country that will not let the Lebanese elect any president unless it is stamped and approved by Iran and Hezbollah. The same thing are going in Syria. It is a shame on the Obama administration to let the regime and the Hezbollah militia and the Shia Iraqi militia butcher the Syrian people for three years Nobody's mentioning a thing. It became like a TV movie or something. You have daily uh, 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 blitzkriegs, helicopters, air force, are bombarding barrels of explosives on the civilian population. You have every day on every sunrise 500 civilian dead. Most of them are kids and women. And uh, nothing is being uh, brought up in the Western press not to upset Iran. Wake up, people. Wake up. If such a thing from what we reach in Iraq... It is not going to wake you up, then we are going to move to a very serious collide in the Middle East. And how about, you know, the terrorists that we're letting go saying, we'll see you in New York? I mean, they're they're making no bones about it. What you said just now, though, is wake up, everybody. And the fact that we should not have a short memory should really ring true to most Americans. And, and unfortunately, the mainstream media is not doing its job. They're covering up everything, and uh, it, it we very well may have another 9-11 on our hands. I think it's just Donna, a matter what of... What needs of, to be done, what mm-hmm. needs to be done and urgently, Iran, somebody, the West, Israel, America, somebody has to put a stick in Iran's wheel. Iran needs to be stopped in the Middle East, not help to progress and expansion more. Uh, Iraq is a perfect location. Syria is another. Uh, Lebanon is a third. If you take the uh, Middle East uh, geopolitical map, the first disconnect with Iran should be in Iraq. The, sh- the nationalistic camp, uh, America needs to cut the deal with them, keep ISIS at bay, they will fight it, uh, you will not have to do it. Uh, the Iraqi have enough pride, they do not want Iraq to uh, go back uh, to the Middle Ages. Uh, Iraq is a decent country. Uh, let's not turn everybody as terrorists as the U.S. press is doing it. The U.S. press is uh, repeating a lot of uh, Iran's uh, 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 political lies and circulation. The first disconnect should be in Iraq. The second disconnect for Iran should be in Syria. Assad needs to be toppled and replaced by a moderate Sunni regime that will be a bridge to the Middle East stability. Syria is a very important country on the chessboard. It has border with Turkey, it has border with Iraq, it has border with Jordan, it has a border with Israel, it has a border with Lebanon. 
Therefore, Syria could go both ways. If Syria goes bad, it will destabilize the entire Middle East and create a security vortex that nobody will know uh, what will happen next. In my opinion, Iran is aiming at destabilizing Jordan, Saudi Arabia, and seizing the whole energy of the region, uh, making America lose its card at the end day. Let me ask you this, Najee. I mean, we've... We've uh, toppled Saddam Hussein, and then we created a vacuum. When at this at that point, Saddam Hussein and the Ayatollahs in Iran, you know, they were kind of fighting each other, and they sort of kept each other at bay. Am I correct in that? But and I'm thinking, if Assad goes down in Syria, and there's all kinds of problems then in Syria, and and wrestling for power there. Um, won't that possibly cause the same type of problem that we've created in Iraq? No. Uh, no, not That's at all. That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, America, in its opinion, removed one problem named Saddam Hussein. Even though Saddam Hussein was known uh, security threat to the U.S. then. He had no link to Al-Qaeda, and there was no reason to strike him after 9-1-1. There was a different reason America went to war, and I don't want to get into that. That's a total different chapter. Uh-huh. But what I want to say, America removed one problem called Saddam Hussein and created a hundred other problems in the area. And all these problems with the head of the snake, which is Iran, nobody's left to stop Iran advanced. And if Iran swallows the entire Middle East the way it is doing now, this is going to degenerate the war between Israel and Iran sometime, and this war is not going to be a fun war to watch. Okay, what I want to say about Syria, there are 20 million Sunni in Syria, okay? The extremists in the beginning of the war, of the Syrian civil war, were only 5,000. We knew exactly where they were and who they were. And nobody did the damn to stop their progress and their advance, okay? Uh, The FSA have over 100,000 fighters on the ground. None of these received support. Today, unfortunately, by the non-intervention of the U.S. in the Syrian camp, the Sunni rebellion has been divided into several spheres of influence. You have part of the sphere is managed by Turkey and Qatar, which are mainly backing the Muslim Brotherhood. Another side of the uh, Sunni rebellion is managed by Saudi Arabia and by Jordan. The third faction of it is managed by Al-Qaeda. And the FSA is sitting on the side watching without any support. The non-support of the SLA, of the FSA, uh, have pushed ISIS to reinforce unchallenged, unchecked. They used to come with millions of dollars in hand. They controlled the oil field in eastern Syria. They pumped millions of dollars. They bought all the weapons they need. And nobody in the administration did anything. Now, is this the position of 20 million Sunni in Syria? No. These guys not even represent the 2% of the Syrian population. It's very wrong to say that the Syrians are extremists. The Syrians are simple people. They're peasants. Their infrastructure have been destroyed. If the right offer is put on the table for them, they will take it. They are tired of war for 50 years in the Middle East. Like the Assad regime have transformed the Middle East into a base, a launch base against Israel. All what the Syrian population wants is to rebuild their country. Their infrastructure is destroyed and to move Syria as an economical powerhouse in the region. Wow. ISIS advance is a threat not only to Iraq or to Syria. It's a threat to the entire Gulf monarchies in the region. ISIS is very well connected to the Iranian intelligence. I don't want to take the show right now that the Assad is bombarding Assad positions. For three years, the headquarters in Raqqa was never one time bombarded by the Syrian Air Force. At the time, all of the free Syrian army position in Syria was, were bombarded 24 hours, seven days a week, day and night, nonstop. There is a big question mark on ISIS. ISIS kidnapped Western journalists, Christian bishops, uh, harassed the uh, uh, political trajectory of the, of, of the Free Syrian Army and uh, 
All of ISIS lieutenants and chiefs were all sleeping in Assad jails at the beginning of the war. He opened their doors in Damascus and let them out. Is there an answer to this? Why did he do it? It's all by design, Donna. And Iran is behind the design. Sounds like what our president's doing. Let out the five worst terrorists that, you know, that we have here in Gitmo and just let them go back to uh, to Qatar and, and possibly scheme more attacks in the United States. You, you wonder, you really wonder whose side this guy is on. Uh, can you, General, are you still there? I know uh, I, I'm just fascinated listening to Najee, but he did talk about the Free Syrian Army and... Uh, can you talk a little bit about when the two of you went over to Syria and and what you did learn there? That was just, it was unbelievable. It was such a great thing. And, and we are so, try so hard to get the mainstream media here in the United States to recognize them. And it's just falling on deaf ears. Well, I think first, uh, I wanted Najee really to lay out everything to you. Nobody lays out the situation in the Middle East and the chessboard better than Colonel Najjar. Oh, it was awesome. I mean, I took the best, notes. <laughs> the best thing you and Don can do tomorrow when you get up is get this recording out to everybody you can in Washington, D.C., and demand they listen to what general uh, the comments that were made, not in general, but a very specific uh, layout of the chessboard and what's happening over there. Uh, and you you need to get that out because nobody in America has heard this past 15 or 20 minutes of what Colonel Najjar has said. And when I travel to the Middle East, I don't go with anybody else but Colonel Najjar. He understands it. He uh, knows what the chessboard is over there. He knows the players. And when we went inside, we're the only Americans that have gone inside to the depth of visiting and vetting out the different uh, factions over there, and vetting out the Al-Qaeda from the Hezbollah, from Assad's forces to the Free Syrian Army. And uh, we met with uh, eight to ten generals from the Free Syrian Army who had defected from the Assad regime. Uh, We met with over 45 different commanders, all dedicated to a secular society in Syria, one of freedom, not one of Sharia. And so, uh, with that said, we came back with our reports. We provided them to the FBI, the CIA, the Department of Defense. Nobody listened to our reports at all. We could have saved a lot of the situation, the uh, 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 operational things that are going now in, in Iraq, if they would have listened to us 18 months ago and supported the Free Syrian Army. And we did not. We ended up absolutely supporting the wrong forces in Syria, as we did in Lebanon, and of course as we supported the Muslim Brotherhood throughout, and Egypt's a very good example of that. So uh, with that in mind, what Colonel Jar has said tonight is the best strategy that can take place within the next 72 hours. Maliki has got to step down. He's got to be replaced. There's got to be an open uh, uh, palm, I would say, uh, to the Sunni leadership, because there is a gate of opportunity here, and it all has to be in a, in, a, in a very specified strategy that Iran cannot overtake and develop all of the sequences of events in Iraq at this time, because as Najee said, this changes the whole world if Iran does, in fact, become the hegemonic power of the Middle East. Colonel? In answer to the general, uh, the point has of no return has been reached with the event of Iraq. The U.S. is squeezed against the wall with very little good options. There are no good options out there, but there are better options than others. Uh, as the general outlined, the uh, Iran has to be disconnected in Iraq. There should be a disconnect. And uh, the Sunni need to be given the opportunity to uh, make that task uh, happen. Uh, of course, uh, do not uh, phrase them as all of ISIS. That is very false. What you have witnessed the last three, four days in Iraq 
was a general Sunni rebellion against what Maliki did uh, in Iraq. He oppressed the Sunni population in a very severe way per Tehran's demand. Uh, the majority of the Iraqi does not want ISIS to gain stage and does not want Iran to progress further. I think they should be consulted. Uh, this is not the old war of Iraq. This is a new mix in the happen. This is a new reading happening in Iraq. What happened 10 years ago is different from what is happening today. You have to read very carefully the equation. Iran has to be stopped in Iraq with the national tribes, with the nationalistic of Iraq. Iran has to be stopped in Syria with the majority of the moderate Syrian that does not want a caliphate in Syria and does not want a butcher to wake up every morning and butcher his citizen with barrels of explosives over Syria cities, and Lebanon is very tired of Hezbollah. Uh, it was a mistake in 2000 when the Israeli withdrew. What they say it was under the Clinton's pressure. The Clintons brought nothing but disaster everywhere they put their hand into. It's time for a political change in America. It's time for an immediate change on the ground in the Middle East to stop Al-Qaeda advance using the right mix on the table. Iran is not the answer to fight the uh, uh, rebellion in Iraq. America needs to filter this equation very carefully and uh, make the uh, exact mix on the table. Absolutely. And I'd like to uh, uh, quote uh, Senator McCain, who I'm, I'm not a great fan of, but he did say something uh, uh, very important this week. The entire national security team of the United States of America needs to be replaced. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it is. That's the destruction that's going on in America and internationally. We have no credit. We have no allies. Here we are as a, a, a former superpower, a, a leader of the world who provided great opportunities around the world, economically, financially, coming to the aid and assistance of countries that were in trouble. Yes, we probably have made mistakes, but in the, in the end, we have to look at today and tomorrow. We have no future strategy. General McInerney and I wrote an article for Wall Street Journal we need a forward strategy dealing with today and tomorrow. We can do nothing about yesterday, but we can do something about today and tomorrow. So the message is, uh, America, you've got to replace this national security team. Obama should be impeached uh, for aiding and abetting the enemy across the board, as we've just seen with the release of those uh, five prisoners from Gitmo. That's aiding and abetting the enemy. And unless America stands up now and takes charge, as General uh, McInerney and General Boykin and I have said, uh, Admiral Lyons, uh, that uh, along with what Colonel Najjar has uh, pointed out to everybody, if we don't take action now and stand up, this is going to be so serious that it's the recovery and the threats to America and to the world are uh, so uh, dangerous at this point in time, that if we don't do something very quickly to change the, the, the direction that we're going, the pain is going to be considerable for the entire world. Colonel Najjar, when we uh, had the pleasure of uh, meeting you earlier this year, and you gave me my shooting lesson, which I will never forget, you did say even back then, you said to me, Donna, I saw it, I saw it in the Middle East, and it's happening here. And that was... Six months ago, six, seven months ago, looks like uh, nothing compared to what's even happening now. We've, we've slipped in, you know, down that sl uh, slope so much more, even in the last half a year. Colonel and General, I do need to interject because I haven't said a word since this interview started, and there's a reason for that. Colonel, when we had the opportunity that Donna was just speaking about to stand in your kitchen and listen to you for the better part of an hour and a half to two hours. All I did was sit and listen, sir. This, this interview with the both of you is epic, in my yeah. opinion. And, and, General, I'll do exactly what you say, and we'll distribute this as widely as we possibly can and hope that uh, 
those that we distribute it to will also distribute it. But Don, I have a message to the U.S., to the administration, to everybody. Let's not overblow ISIS too much. The people of Iraq and the people of Syria, if America makes the right car, can take care of ISIS. ISIS is not a demon with so many octopus with so many heads. The FSA has clashed with ISIS in Aleppo. In one week, they inflicted them 700 casualties. ISIS is rejected by the Syrian rebellion. Hopefully, the people of Iraq will have the opportunity to reject them. But, of course, in the beginning, Maliki has to go. Iran influence has to be stopped. And uh, ISIS could be dealt with if the right car are in the mix. And I have a message to all the good rebels on the ground in Syria. This is not over yet. Iran will not win the Middle East. There are many officers in the U.S., in the world, that will not let it happen. Don't despair. Hold on to your position. Things will change. But how do you fight people who just are on a killing spree everywhere they go? Every single major city in Iraq, it, it, it looks like Germany uh, and, and Hitler killing the Jews. I'm sorry, they have... Uh, Trenches they've built, they line the people up, innocent people, business people, whoever they encounter along the way. Any military people from uh, Maliki's government that laid down their arms have been slaughtered. How do you fight that? That's the problem. These people have the no FSA conscience. I have answered your question. When it uh, collided against ISIS in Aleppo a year ago, mm-hmm. it took the arms against them. It took them out of Aleppo, out of many places in Syria, and it never received any support from the Obama administration. If you arm the right groups on the ground, you bet. (coughs) They will kick ISIS out of Syria, seal back that Iraqi-Syrian border, and if the Iraqis are giving the opportunity, they could also do the same, and the Middle East will take care of ISIS. Let's not internationalize this problem with Iran, with I don't know whom. You're going to make the puzzle much more complicated. I guarantee you, the good Iraqis and the good Syrian could take care of business if Washington approached them correctly and give them an honorable deal on the table. What and do you the think other about what is? What is Turkey doing? What's Saudi Arabia doing? All of these countries that have been armed uh, are sitting there doing absolutely nothing as the Middle East crumbles. So don't look to the United States, everybody, to solve everything. We don't have the leadership now to do it. Well, how other about, countries have uh, got to step up to the plate, mm-hmm. and they've got to do it. Because where's the Arab Council? Well, we haven't heard anything from them. They're afraid. I, they I guess they're afraid. Do. Well, that's uh, well, uh, they're the ones that are in jeopardy. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're going to stand up and fight. Look at the, uh, the armed forces that Saudi Arabia has. They have the most... Uh, Advanced fighters, they have the most advanced weapon systems, all been bought by the United, bought from the United States. Uh, but uh, uh, the other countries have got to start standing up. They just can't depend on America, especially now with our weak leadership. Well, that's what I wanted to ask uh, you two gentlemen. Now, all of a sudden, after saying we're not going to put boots on the ground, President Obama well, said he's going to send a couple hundred troops over there. I don't know whether that's to protect the embassy in Beirut or whether uh, there's rumors that they're going to burn the embassy on Beirut, I'm sorry, in in Baghdad. They're going to burn the embassy in Baghdad. There's rumors of that happening, so it can't fall into uh, ISIS's hands. I mean, this is insane. Well, that's all. General, if the U.S. doesn't move very quick with the right strategy on the ground, it's Al-Qaeda who's going to win, and it's going to burn everything on the chessboard. We cannot wait for the Arab uh, summit or the Arab... uh, whatever you want to call it, to come up with a decision or a solution. They don't have a solution. But the Arab are in desperation when they saw America jumping from one camp into the Iranian camp. And uh, something needs to be done on the ground very quickly to stop uh, Al-Qaeda, both Al-Qaeda and Iran's advance on the ground. I just got word that a very good uh, uh, friend of mine who I've known uh, for quite a while, uh, he's a major general in special operations. He just landed in Baghdad uh, yesterday and he's been put in charge of protecting the Americans first and that's our first priority over there we already have boots on the ground Donna Mm -hmm. okay they're there we have 200 250 more just got there they've got to be used as air ground controllers to bring in air to obliterate any kind of targets that can be ascertained 
uh, of the ISIS forces, uh, all the way from uh, Baghdad uh, up to Tikrit, up to Mosul. Targeting can be done. So you need boots on the ground to do the air ground operations, and we have them there. We have special operations forces uh, operating out of Baghdad uh, already. And so they're there. All we need is a strong commander in chief to say, use them and support because number one, again, we don't want to see another Saigon. We do not want to see another Benghazi. Protect the Americans. We've already uh, uh, had many of them move to uh, Jordan uh, and Kuwait and some back to the United States already. But we had over 4,500 people there as of two days ago. That's the priority, protect the Americans first. Then number two, what do we have to do to stave off uh, ISIS uh, uh, and the Sunnis over there? And uh, Colonel Najjar has uh, opened up a door that the Sunnis want to reach out, but we cannot let Maliki stay in there for we, I say we, everybody, that includes the Iraqis, Maliki to stay in there for another day. He's got to be removed. And you can't side up with the Iranians now that Kerry's trying to do. That is just an absolute a fatal mistake on our part. And I couldn't believe it when I heard that. I mean, yeah. I'm not a military person, and I know that's the last thing you want to do is align yourself with Iran. But ever since Vietnam, all we do with our any kind of military action that we take is politics in the end we had no end game with this whole thing all obama saw was the fact that he campaigned on the you know pulling out of iraq and it's bush's war and all this other stuff so he was bush's war it was but you know what we had no end game and so now we sit here and we show our hand to the enemy saying oh we're going to pull out which we've done a couple years ago i guess and and we're not going to send boots on the ground so it's like okay we'll just wait it out and we're moving in don't get confused by boot we have boots on the ground well we don't have at this point we had a a lot of people taken out though a lot of our military you know not enough we have boots on the ground Mm -hmm. so this gets thrown around all the time we have boots over there is that enough though well, to, what's enough? Uh, enough is I don't know. The, enough is to bring in the air power. Yeah, if the yeah. air power is right, you don't need too many yeah. boots on the ground. I guess. Well, so you I... don't need conventional forces. We always have boots in some way, whether they're intel or uh, whether they're military special operations forces. But a lot of the soldiers, per se, were pulled out of Iraq a couple of years ago. That's what Obama kept saying he was going to do. And well, it's, right. it's, it's gotten so political he refuses to send, you know, troops back in, and then all of a sudden, you know, being the liar well, like that he is, I said earlier, it that. doesn't matter what happened yesterday at all. Yeah, you can do nothing about that. The right. only thing you can deal with is today and tomorrow, and that's why we need a national security team that can deal with today and tomorrow. That can go in there and talk to the Sunnis. Uh, they can go in there and support the Free Syrian Army. We need leadership in America. But the other countries need leadership as well. We're not the only ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, General Sisi, uh, who I just met with uh, six weeks ago, is one of the best leaders I've met in the entire world. And his staff, they're on track. They know what they're doing because they're dealing with the realities of the situation in the Middle East. Mm-hmm. Obama and his boys and girls uh, deal with uh, ideology and politics. And yeah. they don't deal with the reality. So until we uh, get a team in there that can deal with the real world, uh, we're uh, uh, we're going further over the cliff. Yeah, where it's all politics, as you say, and academia is running this country now, and that doesn't work in the in the real world. It just doesn't. I mean, look what's we're not even getting into Ukraine and what Putin's doing over there. The whole world is blowing up, and, and our commander in chief is playing his 170th plus round of golf, and he's at three fundraisers tonight. It, Don, it's insane. What do you, Don, what do you think about all this? What's your bottom line? Well, first of all, whenever I'm in presence of what I consider to be greatness and authority, I keep my mouth shut. My grandfather <laughs> said, "Every time you get the chance, shut up." And. Well, uh, and and a big hat tip uh, to uh, the colonel for coming on here, and of course, always you, general. Um, my thoughts on this: um, while you guys were just talking about that, my question is: Does Congress have the authority to completely wipe out 
the national security of this administration and replace it? And if so, John McCain talking about it, and you know how I feel about McCain as well, sir. Um, do we have somebody in Congress that's got the cojones to actually initiate that type of, uh, of an action if legally they can do it? Well, they can do a no-confidence resolution in Congress, and that's what we're pushing for. They certainly can do that for what we call demand resignations. Uh, we know that probably won't work because there's not enough of uh, the Chavitzes and uh, the Trey Gowdies uh, and the Jim Jordans and a few other that we have in Congress. Right. Uh, and But we're going to push forward a, a no-confidence uh, resolution in Congress within the next uh, two weeks and then hopefully lead to uh, what's provided by the Constitution is impeachment proceedings against Obama. Uh, Colonel, we're talking about trying to get this taken care of tomorrow. How do we do that, sir? We uh, sit down with the agencies in charge of making things happen in the Middle East. We put, we connect the right dots together, we'll make it happen, and it's doable. All right, say you are, and I'm, gosh, I wish I could say this were true, Colonel Najid Najjar, you are the President of the United States. You are the Commander-in-Chief. What would you do now? Uh, we'll send the CIA team to Syria to connect the right groups on the ground, arm them accordingly, give them whatever support they need, uh, create a no-fly zone, uh, turn down Assad Air Force, bombard all the military airport. You don't need troops on the ground. The rebellion, once you neutralize the Air Force, can take Syria very quickly. Uh, we'll make sure that there will be international guarantees, that there will be no massacres, no revenge. We will set up the timetable in a very honorable way for everybody. Assad and his first gang needs to go to The Hague, to jail, anywhere they need to go. It's unacceptable for the free world mm -hmm. to keep a dictator that slaughtered 300,000 people in the street. It's a humiliation on America to let it happen. On its time watch, uh, everybody looked at America as the last resort for freedom, and America cannot let it happen. That's from the Syria side. Mm -hmm. From the Iranians, from, from the Iraqi side, I uh, would uh, connect the dot with the Sunni community, make sure that the uh, Iranian role is finished and terminated in Iraq, and the Sunni community can put an end to it very quick. The last three, four days I've shown you how weak the uh, 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 Iranian uh, authority is in Iraq. It fell like a house of cards. No matter how many billions or trillions of dollars you're going to invest with Maliki, it's all going to go down the drain. Maliki is a dead horse. Turn the page, open a new page with the Sunni community there, disconnect Iran in Iraq, disconnect Iran in Syria, disconnect Iran in the Middle East, and I guarantee you the entire Middle East will be on a stability phase for the next 50 years, and it's doable. All right, what happens? There's your strategy. Now make sure you record that and get it out. It's recorded now, but let me ask you this. We have been, a I don't say we, this president much to my chagrin and everybody else is with a, a half a brain in their backside, is allowing Iran to continue with their nuclear program. And, and like you've said in the past, General, they already really have these nukes. What's to stop them in def desperation from using them? Nothing. All right, so right what now. do we do? We do nothing because we have no leadership to do anything. You'll disconnect Iran in Iraq, General. You'll disconnect Iran in Syria. You'll disconnect Iran in Lebanon. You'll bring the MEK from France. Instead of one camp Ashraf, you'll open for them 100 camp Ashraf, and you'll destabilize this regime of Mullah. You'll bring Iran down. It's There's time for this Mullah regime, since the kidnapping of the American hostages at the embassy in Tehran, it's time for these people, for this regime of murderers, to end, not to support. It's go. time to put a dot for Iran in the Middle East. And somebody needs to have hairs on their legs and do it in America. Absolutely. Colonel well, Najee Najjar, I, I mean, but you can hear the passion in your voice. I almost want to cry listening to you. You see what's going on, and you see what's happening, that happened in your country, is happening here. 
to deaf ears. It's It's got to be maddening to you. Because the Iran has so many well-lubed political machines in the U.S. spreading the wrong information in the press and disinformation and misleading the U.S. public from what needs to be done in Iran without going into names. Wow. The Iranian machine is very well lubed in America, very well organized. Wow. Gentlemen, you told us that you'd give us an hour, and you have. We will gladly keep you on. General, I know you've got a bedtime to be watching for, though. Um, <laughs> well, thank you for having us on tonight. It's been a pleasure and just to have you uh, interview uh, Colonel Lashar with his wisdom and knowledge of the Middle East. Nobody knows it better than he does. He certainly doesn't. I'm actually really speechless. Because Thank you for being on air with you. I only hope that the U.S. will move somehow fast, not to see Al-Qaeda hijacking the entire Middle East chessboard. The damage will be irreparable, and I don't know what will happen to the uh, oil price the next day. I don't there know how the world will wake up if Iran hijacked the whole Middle East platform. Well, thank you for having us on, and we'll be happy to come back on another time. And Naji, uh, thank you for all your time tonight. Uh, Don and Donna are doing a great job, and we love Cowboy Radio, and we're going to get the word out as best we can, as we uh, do try to do every day from Stand Up America, as well as from Cowboy Radio. So thank you hey, all very hey, much. Hey, General, General yes. before you guys go, Colonel, I hope you're still in there with me. Um, I'm still there, Ed on. General... You know in, un, in no uncertain terms, sir, how I feel about you and the respect and the dedication that I have for you. Um, I want to very briefly say something to Colonel. Go ahead, Don. I had the opportunity, sir, to meet you one time. You walked up to me having never met me before on your property in your home. And you made me instantly feel like a friend to you as you did Donna. Thank and you, you very graciously, much, Bob. You graciously gave an entire afternoon out of your time to us. Hopefully the day where Americans can walk as free men and in full security in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq. Don't dream, gentlemen. That thing could be done if America knows how to mix this card. The Arabic people are not against the United States, but lots of mistakes have been done. And it's time to turn the page and open a new chapter. I hope there'll be enough decision makers to reconsider their strategy in the Middle East and mix the right cards in hand. Well, gentlemen. Very well said. Yep. From your lips to God's ears. I'm going to tell you something, both of you gentlemen. I'd fall on a sword for both of you. Oh, thank you, Don and Don. Appreciate that. God bless both of you, and thank you again for your time tonight. Okay. Thank Good you. night. Thank you. Good night, you guys. Thank you so much. Wow. Okay. That was Colonel Najee Najjar, a former intelligence officer of Lebanon during the Civil War there. Again, a colonel in the Lebanese Army. He currently resides in California as a real estate investor. He is certainly a Middle East advisor and, I would say, the Obama... The authority. The authority. I wish... I shouldn't say the Obama administration, but I wish... Someone in D.C. would listen to what we just had on the last hour or so, because that is your answer to what uh, Major General Paul Vallely refers to as the chessboard. Anyhow, um, he's an advisor on terrorism and political affairs for Stand Up America and Major General Paul Vallely, who also, as you just heard, was on with us as well. And he is our partner in crime here at Cowboy Logic Radio, we partner with StandUpAmericaUS.org. And, and I'm, I'm really speechless. Well, I really am. Just... I'm going to do something that we don't ever do, and that is I'm going to cut the show short. Okay? It's 1030. We've been on for an hour and a half, and you just heard an unbelievable hour. And I think that uh, what my job now to do is to get this thing edited mm -hmm. and uploaded so that hopefully every one of you that's listening will help distribute this thing. Just listen to the passion that was in Colonel Najjar's voice. The passion and in some respects the sadness because he sees what's happening to the greatest country ever in the history of mankind going down the toilet because of this administration. 
And what is our commander in chief? And I use that loosely doing tonight. He's at not one, not two, but three fundraisers He's today. At three Democratic fundraisers, after, ladies and gentlemen. After entertaining, quote unquote, dreamers, lobbyists for immigration reform at the White House earlier today. How sad is that, folks? God bless America is all I can say. Have a good week, everyone. i